Hey, it's me, Brianka J, and I'm coming to talk about Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man. And I just have to say, like, this is one of the best books. I simply love talking about this book. I actually um, wrote about him for my thesis, and I just think he's brilliant. And so first, I want to give you some background of information on Ralph Ellison. Then we're going to dive into the work chapter by chapter. So if you're looking for a very in-depth, detailed analysis of Invisible Man, you're tuning into the right spot. Let's get into it. So, Ralph Ellison, Invisible Man. Okay, so the first thing you know is this is a Billings Ramon novel, which means it's a coming of age story. This is the type of story where the narrator speaks for himself and tells the story as he sees it. Um, example of this is Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. Another thing to note about this novel is it's a picaresque novel, which means it's a novel of an outcast. It's also very episodic and is very well plotted. An example of this is Voltaire's Candide. Ralph Ellison was born in 1914 in Oklahoma, USA. Um, note that the Tulsa riots happened in 1921 and the black community was both uprooted and destroyed. So this had a great impact on the way that Ralph Ellison lived as well as his family. And this probably had a great impact on like how he thought and what he grew up to be. He does attend Tuskegee University for a little bit, but he leaves and he actually is not a fan of it as you will see as you read Invisible Man. He has a musical interest at first, so for a little bit he studies um, music professionally, but then his writing takes off. He becomes mentored by Richard Wright, and he falls in love with literature a lot more. Well, not a lot more, but these things happen in life. Um, Invisible Man was published in 1952, and he becomes the winner of the National Book Award. From there, he promises readers and critics alike that he's going to produce a novel, another novel, but he doesn't do so for 40 years. He does produce two essential books of criticism, though, which is Shadow and Act and Going to the Territory. Both of these books have un undertones and themes that help illuminate the major aspects of Invisible Man. So if you have an opportunity, you should check those out. Now, once he's... Once he dies, Callahan, which is a friend and editor of Ralph Ellison, actually goes in to edit the Juneteenth, which was written by the late Ralph Ellison with permission of his surviving wife. Then he takes an even bigger excerpt of his unpublished works and presents Three Days Before the Shooting, which is about a 1,200-page book with very minute changes to chap certain chapters and characters. Just goes to show just how perfectionist like that Ralph Ellison was. Now, before you read Invisible Man, it's a great idea to read Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as Native Son by Richard Wright. If you read these two books, it'll help us give us a little bit of background on exactly what Ralph Ellison is trying to get to, as these two books really inspired his work in the first place. Um, you also have to think about the book starts underground. And this is a metaphor. Why would he start a book underground? Well, the metaphor is about the life of a man that is invisible to the world. He is positing the theory that the black man is indeed invisible. His personhood is invisible and he's only used as a tool most of his life. So going underground shows how he can just be invisible at any given moment. Like a tool can be tucked into a toolbox and never seen again. He's also going underground. He's getting this metaphor from his good mentor, Richard Wright, who wrote The Man Who, sorry, went underground. I had to read my notes. Now, let's get into some of the details here. I have a quote here where he said, but that's getting... Too far ahead of this story, almost to the end. Although the end in the beginning, although the end is the beginning and lies far ahead. So this is inspired by T.S. Eliot, but it's written by Ralph Ellison and it's referring to one, the structure of the work, but two, the greater points that he's trying to make, which is that right now he is in preparation to overcome some of the issues that he's noted 
that put him underground in the first place. So he's like, I'm underground right now, and I'm going to tell you my story, but I'm on my way up because I'm about to fix this. So he's just there for a minute. While he's there, he gives us a picture, a symbol of a radio phonograph. This is our jazz musician. So he's playing Louis Armstrong, and the actual fact that he's playing jazz is a metaphor in itself. It parallels with the modernist movement. It introduces this new way of thinking, this new way of music, this new way of dancing. And it's also talking about how jazz becomes a metaphor for his version of like grassrooted democratic practices and processes, as well as jazz becoming an opportunity for us to slip into the cracks and um, breaks in time. He says, um, slipping in between the grooves, you slid into the breaks and look around. It's about how time can freeze, slow down, or speed, depending on the need of the author. Another quote to pay attention to here is, please, a definition, a hibernation is a covert preparation for a more overt action. So that is a foreshadowing that his hibernation is actually him preparing to go out, out and make actual um, actionable things. So he's like, covert, I'm preparing, I'm resisting by not participating and preparing my attack. And then when I come above ground, I'm actually going to attack. And then he starts telling us what exactly he's going to attack and why. So he brings us to chapter one, which brings us all the way back to his very beginning. So in chapter one, um, which is modeled by Voltaire Candide, is we live in the best possible world. We see young Invisible Man, very hopeful, very optimistic, and very um, naive, right? And then um, we know 85 years ago is what his grandfather brings up. It's Reconstruction of America after slavery. Booker T. Washington talks about this time, too. And Booker T. Washington is a representation of the grandfather. So the grandfather tells young I am, as well as his family on his deathbed, that the goal is to win the war. And the strategy is to yes him to death. That big quote of leave your head in the lion's mouth, yes him to death, grin him, uh, smile, let him swallow you whole till they bust wide open and vomit, which is my very favorite quote, is actually about the strategy of overcoming white supremacy, which is simply to pretend as if you are an ingredient when the whole time you are preparing to take them out, right? This um, covert resistance. So that's the grandfather's advice. Um, and after this, he is kind of rushed out the room, and it, then we go to the Battle Royale scene, which is one of the most popular scenes of this work, and it's actually excerpted a lot. But the Battle Royale scene is a scene that reflects the American dream. The black boys are outsiders and the people that are there in their business suits are sitting around laughing as this white woman has it strapped to her belly, yet she looks so unhappy. It is the most grotesque, one of the most grotesque fighting I've ever seen. But um, it's a couple things happen here. We see a fight. We see how white people are taking pleasure in reducing blacks to impulses they relate to animal instincts. We see them literally taking like pleasure in this and this is not something that's not unseen in literature because we also see this with Thomas Suppin and Absalom, Absalom. So we know that this trend is not made up, but a very real reality that's happening in southern United States. Let's not ignore it. Okay, so that's their way of denying their humanity. Um, that's their way of making them feel inferior, like animals, like dogs, do a cockfight, a dogfight. Um, and it also seeks to make them internalize the stereotype that they are indeed animals and they are less um, human-like than others. Having them beat each other to a pulp kind of reinforces this idea of like this grotesque, barbaric action on African-American part. Um, one thing I also noticed here is that they're putting coins, literal gold coins on the floor and electrocuting these boys. And that's a metaphor as well, how you will always be reaching for something and, you know, you're reaching for something and you can't grab it because there's so much pain attached to it and the idea that you can literally die 
uh, in pursuit of this is insane. And it's a metaphor for the way that we are crabbed in a bucket and we're always chasing after this sliver of a dream that is almost unattainable. Um, but in the end, if they reward them for their brutal violence against one another, they give them a few shillings and send them on their way. And Ayam continues to hold this naivety about the world, and he hopes to assimilate and be seen as an individual, but he really remains oblivious to the fact that these white men don't view him at all. Like, he wants them to see him as different, as special, as smart, and unlike his classmates, but in reality, like, they don't have a differentiation between one black boy and the next, and so he is really naive in his way of thinking. Um... The deviousness of white society in regards to the way blacks are tortured and treated. He wants to believe that this is just a fun game, even though he sees how he's being treated. Um, so he has this opportunity of um, changing his epistemology, or he starts creating it for himself, which is how he understands his place in the world. Um, the significance uh, to differentiate the nature of blacks and the perception of self in relation to the world, like... He wants to know, am I simply a black man or am I a man with complexities, individuality, personality, who happens to be black? So he's battling this idea throughout the entire work. Um, let's carry on. So the other notes I have here is that the satire is based on historical evidence, which I just told you. And then finally, um, he does receive his scholarship to Katiska to Tuskegee, but then he has like a really strange dream, like a fever dream, where he's where he opens the briefcase and he has this letter and it says, "Keep this nigga boy running," and that is also a metaphor for this way that African Americans have begun to feel in American society, and it's actually a dichotomy that we use in our um, regular day to day works, which is simply this idea or this theory that no matter how hard an African American person works in America, you will consistently have to keep running to because they continue to set the bar higher. So if a black person graduates high school, then they're now, now entitled to graduate college. Once they graduate college, they're supposed to, re, supposed to be expected to go to get a master's. They get their master's, then it's like, where is your PhD? By the time they get their PhD, it's like, well, why don't you levitate? Meanwhile, nepotism is very real, and this is so this is the type of thing that he's trying to explain to us at the very beginning of the uh, work. So these are really deep, in-depth ideas about Invisible Man. I hope this was very enlightening for you. I will come back soon to do a, the second chapter of Invisible Man. Um, so stick around for that. Everything else, have a great day. Thank you for joining. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video, if you found it enlightening. And um, leave me a comment below if you have other ideas or symbols that I didn't catch up on or some quotes that you love when reading Invisible Man yourself. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.